Scott Joplin, king of ragtime, was the legendary composer of ragtime music, a pianist and a music teacher. He was born, according to various sources, either on November 23rd, 1868, or November 24th, 1867, and spent most of his childhood here in his hometown, Texarkana, USA. The Texarkana Twin Cities straddles the Texas and Arkansas borders. The Scott Joplin Muriel is located at the heart of the Texarkana's historic arch district. The Muriel was originally painted in 1975 at the prompting of the late local saxophonist, musician, historian, and Arkansas Hall of Fame member, Jerry Atkins. The Muriel was refurbished in 2015. It is on the side of the Ragland building. The Perot Theater at the intersection of West 3rd Street, newly dubbed Scott Joplin Way, and Main Street on the Texas side of Texarkana. It sits across the street from the Scott Joplin Muriel on West 3rd Street. This beautiful Italian Renaissance design theater attracts artists worldwide. It has hosted Scott Joplin's concerts with two grand pianos on stage. His opera, Tremonitia, was performed here. Various concert programs are scheduled during 2017's Scott Joplin Centennial Celebration. H. Ross Perot Jr who ran for the United States President of America has been quoted as saying, the only person more famous than me from Texarkana is Scott Joplin. Many events have taken place at the theater honoring Scott Joplin. Our hometown hero's family came to Texarkana when Scott was nearing his fifth birthday. Giles and Florence Givens Joplin's Scott, an older brother, Monroe, came to Bowie County and Texarkana community in about the springtime of 1873, months before the city was incorporated. Now, let's take a short drive to Cave Springs community in the Cass County town of Linden, Texas, to visit the farmland where Scott Joplin was born. This is Linden, Texas, recently dubbed Music City, Texas in the late 1990s. This is the birthplace of Scott Joplin and blues man, music great, T-Bone Walker. The home of Don Henley, co-founder of the legendary rock group called The Eagles. Inside the post office is a mural painted during the time of United States of America President Roosevelt. His New Deal artwork project was part of a plan to put American citizens back to work again during the depression of the 1930s. This mirror, The Last Crop, was painted by the artist Victor Aronoff. The scene of cotton pickers described the early culture of this area when cotton was king. Earlier, the sawmill was the king in the Piney Woods area of East Texas. Cotton played a major role in Scott Joplin's mother, Florence Givens, and her future husband, Giles Joplin's arrival in the East Texas area. Florence Givens was a free woman from Kentucky and the plantation manager for William and Elizabeth Caves. The Caves led a wagon train from Kentucky to this area along the Cherokee Trace. They decided by vote of all members of the wagon train to settle in the land on the edge of the town and begin a community near a water spring. It was given the name of Cave Springs. Later, William and Elizabeth Caves donated land for the Cave 
Springs Baptist Church and Cemetery in the late 1860s. This was near the time that Giles Joplin, a fiddler player, originally from North Carolina, arrived in Cave Springs from the Hooks Plantation to what was to become the city of Texarkana. Giles was freed in 1863 by Josiah Joplin of the Warren Hooks Plantation near the Texarkana community. Giles had probably been brought to the Texas and Cass County area by the Moores family of North Carolina. Giles had been given to Minerva Hooks at her wedding to Josiah Joplin. Giles married Florence Givens, mandolin and banjo player, and they had an older son, Monroe, before Scott was born in 1867 or 1868. We are on the grounds of Cave Springs Baptist Church in the community of Cave Springs, named after William and Elizabeth Caves in the late 1860s or 1870s. The immigrant train that Caves led from Kentucky camp just across the road. The travelers explored the area and found good hunting and fresh water. They decided this was the place for their new home. This is Cave Spring Cemetery next to the church. The oldest known grave is William B. Caves, May 23, 1812 through October 24, 1881. He died a few years before Elizabeth. And both well after the time that Scott Joplin and his family had moved to the Texarkana area. The Pleasant Hill community is located 10 miles from Cave Springs on the outskirts of Linden proper. Rosenwald School is one of the many rural South learning centers for the advancement of Negro education funded through the Julius Rosenwald School Building Program. The building is under restoration and now houses the Pleasant Hill Center. The Pleasant Hill Quilting Group is well known for their historic presentations using quilts to tell the stories. The historic old Rosenwald School is used daily. Now we will meet the descendants of Florence Gibbons Joplin. Mrs. Honolulu Allen, you are a descendant of Scott Joplin on his mother's side of the family, Florence Gibbons Joplin. Could you please tell us about your family lineage? Did you always live in Linden area? Always. I was born there, Cass County. Well, do you or any of your family members play any musical instruments or sing? Well, I have two daughters, one deceased, and they both play piano. And they were really fond of Scott Joplin's ragtime band and you know, the entertainer. So at the time, we didn't know we were relatives, but they liked the music. That's good. That's good. Ms. Allen, uh, Please tell us what you know about Scott Joplin, especially about him being born at Cave Springs in the 1860s. Uh, did you know his exact birthplace? And did he spend his early, his early years in Linden that you know of? No, I know very little about Scott Joplin. As a matter of fact, I didn't hear about him till after his death. And he didn't spend his formative years in Linden, I was told. I was told that he and his mother left Linden when he was a tiny boy, well, just a kid. Mm -hmm. And they moved to the Texarkana area, and nobody seemed to have kept track of him since that time until he became famous. I see, I see. Uh, can you tell us about uh, your cousin, uh, Eula Gibbons? Oh, you, my granddad was named Charles Gibbons, and he had a brother named Ellie Gibbons, and you, Gibbons' aunt was his daughter, and she remembered 
uh, Florence Hennings Joplin. She remembered that she left the area when she was a young lady and she had a young lad and he was just an arm baby and they never heard of any, anything else about him until after her son became famous. We don't know how he spent his formative years and where he spent them. That's interesting. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us uh, or anything else you'd like to share with us? Um, well, uh, we are all excited that we are descendants of uh, relatives of Scott Chaplin and we have so much information on him and we just would like to know more about him and the connection we have with We don't know what, how we are related and we are trying to find that out. Uh, one last question. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the Givens land that's uh, still in the family and, and where it's located? Well, uh, the Givens land is located in the area of Cave Spring, where Cave Springs and the Givens plantation were two separate places. And the land is still there now. We own our or share of it. Some of the heirs have sold. But the areas there and not many families live there anymore, but the Cubans do own that as part of that area. And we have contributed a portion of our land to a community center here for the city. And it was part of the Cubans plantation. Thank you. I'm here with Mrs. Mary Love. Thank you so much for doing our makeup. You are also a member of the Givens family. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. My great, great, great grandfather was Charles Givens, which is also a descendant of Mrs. Harlow Allen, which was also a Charles Givens' granddaughter. My mother was also a granddaughter of Charles Givens, which is also related to um, Florence giving, but we're trying to get the connection that was some years back. Thank you. In the winter of 1873, the first town lots were owned by Cairo and Fulton Railroad on the Arkansas side and the Texas Pacific Railroad on the Texas side. The lots were sold to the first bidders. Over the next century, nearly every family in Texarkana had one or more members who were employed by one of the nine railroads with regional offices in town. The Lindsay Railroad Museum is in the same building that housed one of the Beasley music stores in the early 1900s. Dr. Rowe, can you tell us a little bit about the piano that's sitting outside and who painted it? I can. Uh, this is something called the Street Piano Project, uh, and it's the baby of Betty Richardson, who used to do urban renaissance paint in downtown Texarkana. Uh, the pianos, there'll be four of them, and they're decorated to go with the, the building that they're going to be housed in. So the piano outside is 1890s Broad Street, brothel, saloon, gambling hall, uh, and so it's decorated to sort of go with that theme. Well, we're here at the Lindsay Railroad Museum, and it is very impressive. Can you please tell us a little bit about the history of the railroads and how it inspired you to create this museum? Yes. Um, Texarkana was founded by the railroads in the winter of 1873 and in the, in the spring of 1874. Uh, the Texas and Pacific and the Cairo and Fulton decided this was the spot for a junction. And so they got together, they named it Texarkana. Uh, and so they started building a town here. They sold town lots. Uh, and so we had the, the center of town, State Line and Broad Street. Uh, and by the time they were through, we had nine railroad companies coming and going through town every day, something like 70 trains every day. Uh, and so everybody in town, every family in town, had at least one person working for the railroad. 
So we are heart and soul railroad town. I see. With all that commuting, uh, there must have been a need for uh, some entertainment. Uh, can you tell us what kind of music was played back then? And if there were any saloons uh, available for the traveling railroad workers? Yes, uh, Broad Street right here had something like 20 saloons, gambling halls, prostitution. We had a big entertainment district called Swamp Poodle. Uh, and so the kind of music that we ended up with actually was influenced by the railroad. Uh, we are on the axis of north-south St. Louis to New Orleans and east-west Memphis to Dallas. And so the north-south route produced a given type of jazz uh, and it's sort of along the boogie-woogie uh, flavor and the Memphis to Dallas had a whole different flavor. And so uh, our two favorite sons, uh, Scott Joplin and Ledbetter, uh, Lead Valley um, are the two that we normally claim as our own uh, and unique styles of jazz in Texarkana at that point in time. So, the Lindsay Railroad Museum is in the same building that housed one of the Beasley music stores here in Texarkana in the early 1900s. And it is also rumored that Scott Joplin played his first commercial hit song, The Maple Leaf Rag, on a piano sitting inside the window. I wish I had a plaque in the front window <laughs> for the very spot that he was on. But yes, that is a local legend, uh, and this was Beasley Music Company uh, in the early days, and uh, everybody came here for their music. Uh, and everybody came to see the local stars and the ones that came in on the railroad uh, who played the pianos, who played the brass bands. We also had three opera houses, so there was a lot of entertainment in Texarkana. And I also understand that when Scott Joplin played that maple rag in the window that all of the people crowded on the sidewalk to listen. And people said that um, that was his last visit which was in 1907. I think that's right. Uh, he got so famous and he went off to the big time and it, his visits home were kind of rare. Uh, but um, we were so proud of him and the music that he produced. And uh, as you probably know, there's murals around town that feature Scott Joplin. And so we're really proud of that. Thank you. You mind if we take a look around? The Texarkana Museum of Regional History is inside the first brick building constructed in Texarkana. It was built in 1879. The Offenhauser Building housed the first national bank and is a Texas historical landmark. Jamie Simmons, you are the curator of the Texarkana Museum of Regional History System. Can you tell us about the museum and exactly what it is you do here? Yes, uh, the museum system, Texarkana Museum System, was founded in 1971 when the Morris family of the Offenhauser Insurance Company donated this building, the oldest building in Texarkana, uh, to, for the purpose of creating a museum and archive. And over the years we've grown to include not only uh, this facility but the Discovery Place Children's Museum and also two historic homes, the Ace of Clubs House um, on 420 Pine and the P.J. Ahern home, which is our Arkansas side uh, property. And um, we include a large archive uh, that's really a regional archive that focuses on Texarkana that includes thousands of photographs and documents that um, uh, depict the history of this area and that's really my job is to maintain those collections and help interpret those for the public through exhibits. I see. This building is the oldest 
brick building in town. Scott Joplin and his family were living here in Texarkana. Can you tell us about his family moving here and a little bit about uh, his early life here in Texarkana? Yes, now his father was brought to Texas as a slave, um, but uh, our best information tells us that his mother Florence was born a free person in Kentucky and came here in her teen years. Um, his father's name was Giles and he was freed um, around the Civil War era time period. Um, when the family, uh, when the uh, Florence and Giles married, um, they were most likely living in the Sugar Hill area of what's now Texarkana and that's where Scott, we believe Scott, was born in 1868. Um, his early life here would have uh, been very different than it is now. The town itself was formed in 1873, so Scott was born before Texarkana existed. Um, the family, once te Texarkana was established, there were a lot of opportunities here for jobs, um, for education, and it's not hard to imagine that that is really why Giles and Florence Scott Joplin decided to move their family into town so that they could follow those opportunities. And um, Scott and his siblings attended Orr School, which is one of the oldest schools established in Texarkana. Uh, the building is still standing on Laurel Street, and um, that was the, uh, the grades went through nine at that time, so there wasn't a high school. Um, but the neighborhood that they lived in, uh, lived in, they would have lived on Hazel Street. And at that time, the town was growing very quickly. So it's, it's easy to see that all of these opportunities were opening up and that Scott's parents would have wanted um, he and his brothers and sisters to uh, take advantage of that, to have those opportunities. I see that the piano that you have here in the exhibit, is that the one that Scott's uh, father brought from Colonel Rogers' home? where Julius Weiss uh, taught music and Florence Joplin was the laundress? That's, it's not actually the same piano. Um, the Julian Weiss, Julius Weiss uh, did work for the Rogers family as a music instructor and it's most likely where he met Scott. Um, Florence Joplin did work for the Rogers family but she also worked for several, several other families. And we know through information that was passed on through Scott Joplin's second wife that um, his mother uh, would take Scott uh, with her to work because he was too young to go to school at the time. Um, and they didn't have daycare, they didn't have kindergarten. And the families who owned pianos would often allow Scott to play and practice. Now, the Rogers family was one of those families. He would practice on their piano, and that's where he met his future music instructor. But the piano we have is from the Wilder family. They lived on the next street over um, from um, the, uh, the Joplin family. And Mrs. Joplin did work for the Wilder family. And uh, we do believe that this is uh, one of the pianos that he learned to play on as a four, five, six, six year old. And um, it's a very big piano, so you can kind of get a mental image of tiny Scott Joplin sitting at this piano and his genius just flowing through his fingertips on this piano. So we're, we're very lucky to have it, but it's not the one that his um, family managed to save up and buy for him. What is uh, included in the Beasley? music store exhibit? The focus, we're in the process of um, expanding the music exhibit and the focus um, will be on the musical history of Texarkana, the regional music, as well as some of the, the famous performers and musicians and composers from this area. Um, Feature will be Scott Joplin, as, as he has been featured in our earlier exhibits. Um, but there are other composers and performers from this area. For instance, Lois Tolles was a very form, uh, uh, famous pianist in her day. But unfortunately, there aren't a lot of people left here in Texarkana who remembered her. Um, so she will be featured along with other uh, composers, such as Colin Nancaro, who grew up here in Texarkana. And also, uh, we will focus on the styles of music that they would have been exposed to. This was really a mini melting pot here for a lot of different cultures, especially in the early decades of the, the city. So there are a lot of different musical styles from folk to classical being brought into this area. And those influences are what created Scott Joplin and others like him. Um, so we will, in that vein, we have um, a lot of different types of musical instruments um, that you would use 
people have used for these different styles. Um, everything from violins and other string instruments. We bring it into the 20th century. We have electric guitars. So we, we take it into the birth of rock and roll and all of that, as well as things, interesting items such as player pianos, which were designed to play themselves. <laughs> so they didn't require a musician. Um, so a lot of different, uh, and these are all related to local history. These are all items that have a local connection and were used by local musicians and composers and, and uh, the average citizen who wanted music in their home. Now can you tell us a little bit about the framed picture that you have of Scott Joplin? Yes, we have a portrait, a very uh, beautiful portrait of Scott Joplin. Um, this was done as part of a contest in 1997. Um, we sponsored a portrait contest. There are not that many images of Scott Joplin. Um, there are two known identified photographs. And uh, we wanted more imagery and plus to recognize uh, Scott Joplin himself, so we sponsored a portrait competition. Um, Lophelia Middlebrooks, as a well known, was a well known watercolorist, uh, won the competition. It's actually the public um, voted on their favorites. So this was chosen by the local public um, and it was purchased for us to be donated to the museum by Dr. Pauline Haynes. Um, so we have this wonderful portrait both uh, because Lufilia Middlebrooks uh, entered this contest and was so inspired and also because through the generosity of Dr. Pauline Haynes purchasing it for us. And um, it's called A Life of Inspiration and it depicts not only um, the inspiration Scott Joplin gives others but also hints at the inspirations that, uh, that he drew on to create his music. So it's, it's a wonderful portrait of him to begin with, but there's a lot of symbolism in it as well. Um, his first music teacher was Julius Weiss, who we mentioned earlier, he, he met as a young child. And he was so impressed with uh, Scott Joplin's genius uh, that presented at a very early age. And he actually offered to tutor him for free. And, you know, this was Julian, Julius Weiss's livelihood, so to offer to tutor the student for free tells you a lot. And his early education was through Professor Weiss, and Julius Weiss left in about 1885, mid-1880s. So I think it, it makes more sense that Scott Joplin decided that um, his education had gone as far as it could go here in Texarkana. As I said before, or school stopped at ninth grade. His music teacher was gone, and there weren't the opportunities. He'd, he'd gone as far in his career as he could go here as well. So the opportunities lay elsewhere, and you know I, I could see that he uh, would kind of look beyond the borders of Texarkana to further his education and to begin his career. There were no music publishers here as well, um, so we do believe that he left to continue his musical education and to begin his career in earnest, um, a serious career as a composer as well as a performer. He was more well known locally as a performer, not a composer. Um, so I do think it makes more sense that he left in his, and we do believe as evidence does show more strongly that he left in his late teens uh, to preserve, pursue his education, um, most likely going to Missouri first. Um, that's where we find him next and um, where he made some of his early strides and um, career making decisions happened in, in Missouri. Do you know what year Florence Givens Joplin died and if she's buried here in Texarkana, Texas or Texarkana, Arkansas? We don't know the exact date of her death. Um, she last appears on the census in 1900 and we also have city directories that show her through 1901 at the same Hazel Street home that Scott grew up in. But she disappears from the record after that. So we believe she passed away somewhere between 1902 and 1904. Now we don't know exactly where she's buried, but given where she lived, um, it's most likely that she's buried in Woodlawn Cemetery, which is on County Avenue. And um, it's not very far from Hazel Street. And we do know that um, there are other relatives of the family that are buried in Woodlawn. So it makes sense that she's buried there. The, unfortunately, 
Woodlawn is one of the oldest cemeteries and it's also in a little marshy area. So um, at that time you didn't have to have a tombstone. So if she didn't have a tombstone then her grave site would be unmarked. But even the older tombstones have sunk over the years or been damaged. So there's not a standing tombstone so that we can prove that she was buried there. And I think it's very likely that's, that's the most likely place she was buried. Does the museum still have the unpublished manuscript by Anne and John Vanderlee, The Early Life of Scott Joplin? And can you tell us anything that you've discovered from it? We do still have um, that manuscript as well as a huge amount of correspondence between the Vanderleys and the people they were interviewing. Um, I'm not sure I would say that we've discovered anything from the manuscript because the research done primarily by Ann Vanderley um, is just extraordinary and in-depth. In 1959 she was here in Texarkana interviewing people who personally knew Scott Joplin. So it was the first major work of, of research aside from uh, the Berlin work, that I mean the Rudy Blush work, that um, um, actually really got to people who knew him. And so later works are all based primarily on some of the research she did. Now I do want to point out that some of the things we've come to accept um, grew out of that work. For instance, the idea that Scott Joplin was actually in his late teens, not early teens, when he left Texarkana, grew out of that work because she interviewed um, a lady, Mrs. Zenobia Campbell, who went to school with Scott Joplin and remembered him. So that placed him in Texarkana at a specific time. So the value of the work that she did is extraordinary, but later works all, always start with her base point and go from there. So I think it's an important work for that, and we're lucky to have all of the correspondence as well. Um, she, uh, she and John Vanderley both corresponded with local citizens to continue the research until um, well into the, the 1960s. So it's, a, it's quite a significant body of work. Do you still have the vintage video on Scott Joplin at the museum? Uh, can you tell us who made it and uh, when was it made? We do still have that video and it was actually made through a grant project sponsored by the museum system in 1988 and it's in desperate need of digitization because it is in old format so we don't actually show it anymore uh, because we don't, the, the equipment really is, is not the proper equipment. Um, but it was, it was produced uh, by the museum system through a grant specifically to help promote um, awareness of Scott Joplin locally. And again, it did draw on these earlier resources, so we were able to um, include uh, interview clips and things like that. The late historian and musician uh, Jerry Atkins did a lot to promote Scott Joplin and his music here and ar even around the world. So can you tell us a little bit about Jerry? Jerry Atkins um, is really, he should be remembered as Texarkana's musical historian. Um, he was the keeper of our musical history uh, throughout his life and was a musician and musical journalist as well and an author. So um, he, he did research into our musical history, but he also was part of that history as a performer um, in his, his uh, teens and twenties he, he had a band um, here in Texarkana and he documented all of the, the wonderful uh, places around town where you could go to hear wonderful music and um, hear the uh, perform performers who went on to become nationally and internationally known. Um, so everything from honky tonks to little cafes where you could listen to great jazz and things like that. He's most well known around town. I think most people who remember him remember his um, show on KTXK every Saturday, The Enjoyment of Jazz, which um, I listened to that show growing up and was not really familiar with jazz before I started listening to it and have an appreciation I didn't have prior to that because of his show. And so most people remember him for that, but again, he, he did a great uh, amount of research on our local musical history and also was one of the, the people who helped kind of spur the renewed interest in Scott Joplin locally. He was among those who worked really hard to um, have a mural done to commemorate Scott Joplin. And um, he was, uh, just after his death in 2010, he was, uh, initiated into the Arkansas Jazz Hall of Fame 
So, um, and his collection of, of uh, his music collection was donated to the University of Texas and is an incredible research resource. So, I think, I, I do think that he's, he was really responsible for preserving our musical past and, and helping connect people locally to that. Now, Jamie, can you tell us how Giles Joplin came from North Carolina to East Texas? We know that Scott's mother, Florence, came to Cave Springs community near Linden as a free woman from Kentucky. Yes, Giles was brought to uh, Texarkana as a slave, as, as we said, and um, uh, Florence came to uh, Linden, as you mentioned, as a free woman, and we believe they met. Um, my information ha has always stated that um, she was the caretaker of a church uh, close to the plantation where uh, Giles lived, and that's how they met. And um, the uh, you know the, the the controversy over where specifically Scott Joplin um, was born kind of arises from the fact that um, Florence Givens, later Florence Joplin did come to Linden first, that's where um, her family migrated to. But we believe that she did meet Giles here in the Texarkana area, and that his, the, where he was living is actually closer to where Texarkana is now. Of course, Texarkana didn't exist, but the community people were already living here. Now, uh, can you tell me if Giles a slave that lived in the Hooks area before marrying uh, Florence and living uh, with her next door to Cave Spring Plantation outside of Linda, Texas. Can you tell me, uh, did they really live in that area? They did live, apparently moved back and forth several times uh, before settling around what's now known as Sugar Hill. Um, they did uh, meet probably in the Hooks area, um, and uh, but you know again this is where the lack of documentation mm -hmm. is really bad in this situation. We we have difficulty establishing where they were because the official documents we do have, for instance, census records, things of that sort. Um, census records are only collected every ten years, so we can establish where they were in. 1870, but um, where they were in 1868, 1865, that's more difficult to establish. And it was, there weren't travel documents that were generated by moving back and forth from Linden further north following work. Um, and that's often why so many people moved around in this area, shifted around to different parts of, of the area where we are now because they were looking for work. So. It's, it's hard to document all of that. So the, the basic answer is we just don't know for sure. Well, Jamie, you have given us so much great information. The fans of Scott Joplin worldwide um, preparing for the Scott Joplin Centennial in 2017 celebration. It will be the 100th year of the hometown hero's death on April 1st, 1917 in New York City. Uh, how is Scott Joplin viewed by the citizens in the four states area and in his historic downtown Texarkana region? Well, I think that um, citizens of this area are, are finally really beginning to understand um, Scott Joplin's importance in musical history, international musical history, and also em embrace him and, and claim him in a way that um, hasn't been done before. Um, we are uh, we're very proud that he grew up here and his musical training took place here and that he started his career here in Texarkana. And you can see that in areas like just a few blocks away from the museum system here. Um, there's a beautiful mural that was just recently, the, the original mural was done um, uh, more than a decade ago, and just within the last year it was refurbished by Art Pletcher, a local a mural artist. Um, so it had a facelift, and uh, again, that mural really reflects his impact on, on musical history and also how Texarkana influenced 
him as a musician through the symbolism of that, that mural. And then, of course, here um, we uh, have the exhibit um, with his piano and we interpret his life here. There is a park named after Scott Joplin here in Texarkana as well as um, historical markers. So I think we're, we're actually, um, as a community, embracing Scott Joplin um, as a native son in a way that um, we, we didn't um, shortly after his death because he wasn't well known at that time. And we finally come to understand how important he was to us and to the world. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us about your museum and about the history of Scott Joplin here in Texarkana. The historical landmark for this, the old R School building, was designated in 1976. Scott Joplin attended school here until age 14. He was a student, but also later taught music here and at his local church. The original school building, constructed in 1880, had two floors. After a fire, it was reconstructed to a one-story building. Now under refurbishing, it houses a missionary ministry church, but is still owned by the original organization, the Twin City Federation of Colored Women. Inside, we will meet the great niece of the King of Ragtime. Mrs. Learma White, you are the great niece of one of America's favorite sons. How are you related? I'm doing pretty good. Scott Joplin was my mother's uncle, my grandfather's brother. And of course, we never met, had the opportunity to, to meet him. but. At that time, the family and units were pretty close together, and uh, they were close-knit family at that time. And uh, when we got old enough to know it, he, did, he no longer lived in Texarkana. We know he was a great musician. Do you have any other family members that play any other musical instruments or, or that sing? I would like to say just about all of my immediate family read music and can play some, but not to the degree that Scott did. I understand that you had a daycare once upon a time and that one of your traditions was the song called uh, School Songs. Can you tell us a little bit about that song called School Days? Well, uh, School Days got, was a popular little song when we were in elementary school. I'm almost sure that's where I got it from. Here at old R School is where I attended school uh, from the first through the sixth grade here at R School. And we had a music teacher named Mrs. Allen. She was very good at the instrument. And that she taught us that song, I imagine, when I was about third grade. Would you do us a big favor and just sing just a little bit of that song for us? Thank you so much for that. 
Now, getting back to Scott Joplin, um, did you ever travel uh, to participate in any events or programs that were honoring him? Well, in the later years when he became notarized because of his music, and of course it went, but at this time we were teenagers, at least teenagers, and uh, we attended programs that mentioned him, but more emphasis were put on him after I got grown, not so much as a teenager or a child. And so all we were would be invited uh, to various events uh, recognizing him. In fact, I forgot that song. Was it Wheels or something that made him so popular in the later years? I forgot the what, what the name of the song was. The Entertainer? Was it The Entertainer? The Entertainer. All right. The Entertainer. That's what it was. It made it. He became notarized at that time and recognition and of course that not so much in this area but in other areas because I remember my sister and I were invited to Sedalia, I believe Missouri in recognition of him and his song and somewhere along the line there was a postage stamp made of Scott Joplin. I don't know if you remember that or not but we were invited to the unveiling of the poster. All, all the recognition we got was from a Sedalia, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And of course, we were grown at that time. But as kids, uh, teenagers, we, we didn't have that. Now, if you don't mind me asking, what year were you born? 1920. And it was right here in Texarkana? I only moved one time from my mother's house to where I am now. <laughs> All right. Now, Scott Joplin uh, was uh, the Pulitzer Prize w winner. And now after his death, uh, he also received a Grammy Award and some other awards. Now, do you or any other of your relatives in Texarkana have any of those awards? No. And Basically, most of the awards that was received, my mother's sister, Danita Fowler, who has long since passed away, uh, received them, but we didn't. I see. Now, we know that Scott Joplin died on April 1st, 1917, in New York City, and is buried at St. Michael Cemetery in New York. Ms. White, where, do you know where his parents, Florence and Giles Joplin, are buried? No, I don't know any. The communication, transportation, finances, all came into play in the, at that period. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the most, we, my sister and I, when they had an uh, unveiling of a Joplin postage stamp in uh, Missouri, I think we went to San Antonio. We got invitations to San Antonio to a statue, I think, of Joplin put in a park in San Antonio. We were invited to that. We were invited to the unveiling of a stamp, which I think was in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And maybe one or two other events that, that that's not coming to my mind at this time. But it was he had passed on a long number of years. I see. Now we did talk with Jamie Simmons who is the curator of our Museum of Regional History and she told us that she thought or it was thought that um, Florence Givens Joplin was interred in the Woodland Cemetery on State Line Avenue with other family members. Um, though most of the headstones are shrunken now. Mm -hmm. Let's we'll see. I don't, I don't really recall us being made aware of that. I possibly so, you know, with my memory like it is now. Mm. You know, I know my father's buried out there. Uh, 
but I won't say I I, I won't say it because I'm not. I, it's been so long. Mrs. White, thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk with us. Um, I just appreciate uh, you, your organization, uh, this group, taking the interest to keep this alive. Because if we don't talk about the contributions that have been made, our young folks won't have anything to work towards. And so I'm just saddened that uh, so many people who get recognition don't live to get it themselves, but their families receive the benefits of it. But whatever, if it's good, pass it on. And we thank God for the contribution that Joplin has made. I'll tell you one thing, uh, that, what was that movie that, ha that featured Joplin's music? Uh, the the Sting. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. it, it was a blessing. It was. it was a blessing. We got more calls and recognition after the stain came out, and otherwise, nobody would know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, organization. Thank you. The Regional Music Heritage Center is the creation of Dave Mallet. It is under renovation to be completed in the coming months. The center will play a large role in the upcoming Scott Joplin Centennial in 2017. The Centennial will be a year-long celebration marking the 100th year death of Scott Joplin. He died in New York City on April 1st, 1917. Dave Millette. Will you tell us about the purpose of the Regional Music Heritage Center? Well, over the last few years, Warren, I had been uh, intending to retire. And so I wanted to return to my hometown of Texarkana. And as I began to look into things here, I became very much aware, because I've always loved music, of uh, things that I didn't know about in the past. And it turns out many people did not understand the importance of the region surrounding Texarkana, Marshall, and Shreveport in American music heritage and world music heritage. Boogie Woogie originated near Marshall, Texas in the 1870s. And from that, it spread almost immediately to Texarkana, where in our Swamp Poodle District, uh, the most famous, best understood and heard Boogie Woogie line of all time, known as the Swamp Poodle Bass Line, originated. From Boogie Woogie we get rock and roll. From Boogie Woogie we get jazz. Without Boogie Woogie, jazz, and rock and roll there are no distinctly American music forms. Also from Boogie Woogie, Scott Joplin uh, frequented the Swamp Poodle District as he was growing up and he heard the Boogie Woogie and the stride and the other uh, piano forms being played. He combined that with what he learned from Professor Julius Weiss, who taught him European music and European music theory. And he took the existing ragtime, which already existed before him, but he made rules for it. And it therefore became, to our knowledge, the only popular music form in history that actually has a set of rules that he expected to be uh, used when it was played or composed. I see. I see you have a lot of old rows of music for the piano here. Um, you've even got some rows for Scott Joplin and Texarkana renowned composer Colin Nancaro. We we do. Do do you think that uh, they knew each other? No, there's almost no chance uh, if they ever passed each other because. Uh, Conlon would have been seven or eight years old at the time that uh, Scott Joplin passed away, and we don't know that Scott Joplin came back to town uh, in the last years of his life. Do you think that you could play a role or two for us on the piano? I'd be more than happy to. What I'm going to play for you today is Scott Joplin's Magnetic Rag. This 
Magnetic Rag was composed late in Joplin's career, and it's one of his great masterpieces. Uh, and when he played, he played the way he wanted everyone to play his ragtime, which was note for note and precisely by the rules. As he learned them from Professor Julius Weiss in the home of Colonel Rogers here in Texarkana as he was growing up. Uh, this particular role was made in 1917. He was already suffering the debilitating effects from syphilis that later killed him. And so we're going to play this for you now. We're going to play it on our 1928 Marshall and Wendell piano, which is both very authentic for playing uh, ragtime, but it was also the piano that Conlon Nancurl, our other great favorite son, preferred for the playback of his music, and, and he also owned two of these and composed on them. So right now, we're going to hear Magnetic Rag. This is the P.J. Ahern Home Museum. It was built by Patrick and Mary Ahern in 1905 and became the center of music in the Twin Cities. This is the music room on the first floor of the mansion. Scott Joplin could have very well played here at the Ahern Home in this very room during his last visit to Texarkana in 1907. His family home was only a few blocks away. Mm -hmm. 